Welcome to the Mike on Much podcast. I'm joined here in the studio with our pop culture aficionado, Shane Cunningham. And, and I think maybe a Mike on Much first. I don't remember if we've done this before. Certainly not his first time on the show because he is returning maybe for the fourth time. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a friend from Los Angeles, writer, producer, director, award winning, uh, Matt Unsworth. Very tanned man. <laughs> You've mentioned this, yes. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what's unique about this is you were sitting in for Max Kerman, who in a weird sort of like uh, switch of, uh, it's like, a, what are those movies? Pa like It's like passing two trains passing the night or something like that. Exactly. Like well, Freaky like, Friday or thank something. Thank you. Yeah. It's like he's in LA, you're in Toronto, yeah. when normally you're in LA and he's in Toronto. Oh, I didn't I think about that. Yeah, you both have swapped locations. This is historic, though, right? Because we've never done one without Matt. I don't think so. It's big, big shoes to fill. Yeah. I hope he uh, do them okay. Like, I think there's been a couple without me, but. There, there, yeah. <laughs> He's less disposable. There's got to no, have been an episode where Max wasn't on it. No? I don't think so. It's a good question. I can't recall if there has been. It, it, I mean, either way, this is incredibly unique. Uh, Max is in transit. He was he was said he was having a full travel day, so he couldn't call in, but he did insist because we were like, well, we're not gonna we're not gonna do one without you. Do He's we like, think he's jealous? I don't I know. I feel like he is. I, well, see, I wrote him, I was writing him and uh, Amanda Ash, and we were talking about how we were gonna miss each other, and then I text him, I was like, Well, if you want me to fill in for you on the mom podcast totally can do that mm -hmm. and then he didn't write me back for like two hours and i was like oh <laughs> oh he's not into that idea well and then he got a little uh, hot i thought a little passive aggressive or something when you had uh, <laughs> not made fun of one of his topics but maybe called it into question at being a little soft i was just making sure that i wasn't missing anything <laughs> because just to do a rundown we are going to cover the uh, snl cast member who was fired yep. shane gillis and uh, we're going to discuss who we prefer, Leonardo DiCaprio or Brad Pitt. And you had said, wait, that's it? That's the topic? <laughs> I want to make better? sure there wasn't some feud going on that I missed or like, you no, know. No, I, I, I agree. I, I asked that him. was my first inclination too, but I didn't want to say anything because I, I was pretty sure that was just it. But then Max, his response was a little hot, I found. He was like, how about you use your big boy brains and do some <laughs> research, guys? And I was like, I like the topic. It's just, it's just Unsworth. And <laughs> no. yeah, then you threw Unsworth under the bus. Well, I was scared because Max rarely gets mad or even that overtly. It even it passed passive aggressive into a little aggression. I found it kind of funny. That he yeah, wrote I, like I would be shocked. He's probably listening to this right now and being like, I was just being funny on the text, guys. Like, Oh, you thought he was being funny? Yeah, yeah, I thought he was just hundred percent. Yeah, you th you thought so too. Yeah, I do. Oh. I do think there's a question as to whether or not I because he was the one that suggested that we just do it without him, which does feel a little weird. He's been our partner in crime for like over 150 episodes probably now at this point with all these freedom episodes, and uh, but he was like, no, do it. But then I wanted to give him a couple outs because sometimes you don't want to say like right. here's, here's the truth. If I was on vacation and Max and Shane and you did one without me, I'd be a little like you know, of but course. but sometimes I'd be embarrassed to say that because you never want to yeah. seem like. You don't want to share. You don't want to be vulnerable that way. You kind of want to seem like you're, you're you're cool about it, you know. But I genuinely think Max is cool about it because I gave him like three outs off text with you guys, where I'm like, "Are you sure?" Like, and then he was like, "Absolutely, 100% do it." We did try to find a, made a way to make it work. We're gonna do it tomorrow morning, but this is your last night in town. Yeah, I know. This is like we got some juice to tonight. We're, I mean, full disclosure, we're drinking some beer. And before we go any further, I forgot to say, Intern Erica's back. Intern, Erica, get on the mic. Hey. Welcome back. Thank you. How was Vancouver? Amazing. Are you happy to be back? So happy to be back, you guys. I have a new outlook on the world. The mountains have changed me. What Did you was, do uh, drugs out there? <laughs> 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 are, they, are they still in your system? Yeah. Uh, what was this? What was the highlight of the trip? Oh, wow. You definitely did shrooms. <laughs> <laughs> no, I didn't. You swear to the Lord? I swear to the Lord. I don't do drugs, just so you know. Okay. I thought you were going to say, I swear to the Lord, I don't believe in the Lord. And then just keep <laughs> it moving. Um, highlight of the trip. I've never been to the West Coast. I've never seen a mountain, really, other than the blue one mm. in Collingwood. And they're just incredible. Like, they're very captivating. I felt like I was on, like, the set of a movie the whole time I was there, yeah. being surrounded by all the mountains and the... So you just looked at Fresh mountains air. the whole time? Yeah, that was great. I went to a, a railway museum, which was awesome. <laughs> I went to this little town outside Vancouver called Deep Cove. Okay. Mm -hmm. Stunning. Very beautiful. If anyone ever is in town, it's like 20 minutes outside of Vancouver. I recommend. Well, wow. Sounds like, like a, a life-changing trip. <laughs> 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 um, Matt, you listen to our podcast from time to time. 
Oh, pretty much every episode, I'd say. So, you, thank you. You're very kind. And by the way, I haven't even said this. I said he was a writer, producer, stuff. He has one of the best podcasts in the game, Heist Podcast. Uh, Heist. We were actually having like drinks at uh, your brother's place, uh, and everybody kept saying Heist like you. Like you have a catchphrase. Heist. They'd all Heist. Do, Heist. They were all saying it. I was like, shit, your stuff's uh, your stuff's going, man. Yeah, man. I uh, want to meet your uh, partner. Simon. And my partner wants to meet you. I know. Sai, we, you, you've been on the sh- you've been on the show, but Colin multiple yeah. times. Your heists always get the biggest laugh. I I uh-huh. was I was out with uh, Simon and Matt on Saturday night, and I said you that, met him. Oh, I was on oh, the podcast, geez. so I met what? him when I was in L.A. Oh, it, not recently, like back when you were in L.A. I went out with him in Toronto. Yeah, I met him in L.A. and then he was in town. I was out with him Saturday night. But you did the podcast again? No, yes. no, 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 okay. no. We didn't do it. They on said, Saturday. "Don't tell Shade." <laughs> that we, we brought our rig and we want to do an episode right now. No, they didn't. But I said, "You guys know, like Shane is taking it very personally that Max and I have both been on heist, and he's only been ever called when you guys need like a like a comedy fill in on the call in." Yeah. And then you said, "Fuck, he's never come to L.A." That's, that's the issue. Yeah. That's the only reason. Oh yeah, I'm not. I'm not mad at you. No, no, no. But we're we're dying to have you on the pod. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that'd be fun. Yeah. May I ask, um, how do we all know each other? Where's the well, connection? Well, the connection is here. Much music, probably. That's high school. Where... You forget high school, Matt? What? Do you forget high school? We went to the same high school? Bro, we never hung out one. Did we actually go to the same high school at the same time? No. Okay. Well, no, but... We're... Yeah. You're right. So, I, I mean, just wanted okay, to mention I was, that. No, I was going to get to that, though. I would say I uh, became friends with Mike when we were working here at Much Music. Yeah. I kind of st- got... I kind of took over his job... When you went on the band thing, right? Sort yeah. of. Yeah, a little bit. And then when you came back, I took off. You left for LA we and I got out. your gig. Yeah. yeah. When my band failed, I came back and luckily <laughs> you were moving on to LA. So the job opened right up and I got it. That was perfect. Beautiful timing. Though. The timing like, was perfect. You guys are always on the right yeah. like path. We're on the right trajectory. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've just been buddies working here. Same as Shane. I mean, yeah. Uh, through and through. And then you came out to LA and we had some good times with your brother that time. We came out and you let us stay at your place for like a week. It was so kind that was of super you. Fun. you uh, I've, we've talked about this on, on previous pods, maybe if you haven't heard them, but w- what was really funny is uh, Matt had like a, uh, a whiteboard with a bunch of like his tasks for the, uh, <laughs> for the week. And so it would be like, oh, you know, buy these uh, groceries, got to do the dishes on Wednesday, get kitty litter. And then it was like murder Mike and Greg in their sleep. <laughs> and then after that, it said, remember to DVR the voice. Like, he, he, <laughs> he continued on with his tasks. Task lifts, but he buried it like he mid. It, in there. it was like on the fridge or the wall. And Greg and I, like you know, he didn't bring attention to it, but it was very, very funny. But that was awesome. We, yeah, comes. So like you know, since Matt has moved there and, and done all sorts of amazing things, you you, uh, you were writing on a sitcom last season. Uh, you've directed a million great things. You obviously do the great heist podcast. But we've maintained our friendship because we have the Hamilton connection. You're born and raised in Hamilton. That's the other thing. Yeah, we're all from Hamilton. And our yeah. workforce when you worked here, uh, we were all very, very close. Yeah, we were crew. We were partying a lot back Dude. then. No one had kids. No one was married we had way more people at was work than we do now it was yeah. the dream it was, it was the really best. the dream uh yeah so anyway that's how we know each other thanks for asking erica that was some yeah, no uh, good hosting right there for people that maybe don't have context and max is down in la a lot so you end up seeing max quite yeah, often i see him whenever he comes out it's super fun yeah he gives me a call we'll go for some drinks get some tacos we went over to the E1 E1 guy's house in Malibu. Chris Taylor? Chris Taylor's house in Malibu. Yeah, I've never, I've never been mm, to the Chris Taylor house in Malibu. Yeah. Um, Go to a basketball games with his dad. It's it's always an adventure with that guy. Would you see Lakers or Clippers? Uh, no, UCLA. Oh, college basketball. Yeah, they Do you like go to Chris Taylor's house when he's not there? He's just like, here's the keys <laughs> to the castle. <laughs> I wish. No, he was there. Oh, okay. How is that Malibu house? It's pretty sick. Pretty ballin'? It's like on top of a mount, like a top of a hill looking over, like legitimately looking over the ocean. And there's like a sweet... I don't, think, I don't think it's affinity pool, but it's basically that. Man. Mm-hmm. You can see the ocean from the pool. Right. Chris Taylor doing pretty well. Yeah. Shouts yeah. to him. Uh, yeah. So anyway, uh, you see Max. Actually, one of our first podcasts ever was uh, Tim McAuliffe, who if you listen to like episode two or three when no one would actually be on our show, you got us that interview, Matt. Yeah. Thank you for it's that. Oh, dude. We had a good night that night, too. That, oh, I've, I've said constantly. I, I feel like we're just telling stories, but <laughs> the most hungover I've ever been on a plane, like the worst where I like I, I legitimately was like, what am I doing with my life? Like, I want to die right now because of the way my body feels. I don't think I'll make it to back to the East Coast. Uh, we, we did the interview with... Tim at his place in Silver Lake and it was me Max uh, Matt Unsworth and Tim McAuliffe and we're kind of like hanging out we do this great interview talks about his time writing on Jimmy Fallon and all these shows with this in-depth interview and then afterwards like oh do you guys like want to have a, uh, like a drink we, we you know he's telling us stories about he, he was working on uh, Last Man on Earth at the time yeah so we just start drinking and now we're kind of like having a night but Max and I are flying out the next day Max is flying to Vancouver I'm flying back to Toronto and our but we're going to the airport at six in the morning and so at about like I'd say like 1130, 
11, you know, 10 to, to midnight. Max is like, all right, well, uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, the hotel where Max and I were staying. And he's kind of giving me that look like, Mike, this is our exit. But like, <laughs> I could tell that Unzi and Tim McAlph weren't shutting it down anytime soon. I kind of gave like Unzi a look like, and then it was kind of like, uh, we're going to still go. So I was like, all right, Max, I'll see you back there. And Max is like, oh. Okay, and Max leaves. Why does Max have the restraint to leave at that point? He's like, smart. He's smart. Right. He's I, a smart man. But he misses well. out on a lot of fun. That's true. But, you know, I think, like, having the discipline to do that, some, that's why Max is him and why I eventually, the, the three of us got into the hot tub. <laughs> so there's, uh, yeah. so, so there's, there's a hot tub, and it's the three of us, and we ran out of beer, so then Tim just started grabbing things like wine or, like, uh, rum. Like, we just started drinking what was ever a left. Rum and wine mix. <laughs> yeah, well, there, I think there was, like... Uh, a bottle of scotch getting passed around the hot Yes. Wow. And, and you're just like trying to yeah, get that hungover? sounds like a hangover, yeah. Oh, after drinking beers. So then we're just talking. We're just telling. So we're laughing. We're having a good time. And then at about like three, we're like, all right, like right, let's get out of here or whatever. So me and Unzi like leave. And I stumbled into the hotel at like, I don't know, like 3.30 or by the time it finally got me back to where our hotel was from. Somewhere. What time's like, the flight the next morning? We had to leave for the, the flight at 6. I just remember. A.M.? Yeah. So I like laid oh down God. and closed my eyes. And then I just I just was like, someone was shaking me. I was like, <laughs> and it was like Max above me. He's like, we got to go, Mikey. And I was like, yep, yep, yep. I'm coming. I got to go. I got to. I'm coming. And then I like quickly packed my shit. And then we went. And then we, you know, I was telling him stories and we were ha- having a laugh. And he's like, good luck. I'm like, thank you. And then I just remember sitting like at LAX waiting for my flight. I think I flew it at like whatever it was, 730 in the morning or something. And it was like, you'd think, oh, I can just fall asleep when I got on the plane. But it wasn't that. It was like that thing where you're kind of in like physical hell. <laughs> uh, so anyway, I've always said that the, my worst like flying experience ever was that night in Silver Lake after doing episode two of the podcast. There's no worse place to be hung over than an airplane. It's the worst. No way. Yeah. You're trapped. Trapped. Yeah. Our uh, buddy had a bachelor party once and I had partied like the most I'd ever party in my life to the point where I was like, Near death, I would say. Oh, and then I had a flight the next morning, and oh my god! I'll, Where I'll were you guys flying from? Vegas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, our friend Mike M. Oh, him. and you know what's funny? That's the trip where Max and I drove from Vegas to L.A. to do the. Oh, that's the same interview. one. Yeah, wow. we skipped the flight home and then went to, on to L.A. to try and make this pod happen three years ago. But you still got your uh, hellish flight. I still, oh. I still Kindred went spirits. for it. Well, and it was also one of those things. Whenever it's the last night. Well, this brings me back to my question to you. This is your last night, but you're flying out tomorrow, like at a reasonable time. Yeah. Are you going to go for it tonight, or are you like at the end of your run? Uh, I'll go for it <laughs> as long as uh, people are going for it. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean, I it's the only reason I'm here right now. I told my <laughs> wife, I'm like, I haven't seen him in years. I exaggerated a little bit, but I was like, <laughs> cut that out. Party tonight. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, I'm down to party for sure. It's like I've been getting better and better at coming back because it'll always be if it's Christmas or summer, be visiting friends and family whom I love and miss so much, including you guys, and I'll go. I'll, now I plan it out as it like on a calendar, like. Monday's this, Tuesday's this, like Wednesday, like just like I just came from seeing my grandmother. Like I went back to Hamilton, saw my grandmother, hung out with her. Last night I was at my cottage for a night with my dad and like a good family friend. And so every single day is planned out. But you spaced it out pretty good then. So you, it's not like you just come from a, you just came from a hangover. You're, you're two nights recouped from not being hungover. No, no. I went out last night with another friend at oh, night. Oh, shit. And at my cottage, <laughs> we like did it up. Oh. So that's what I'm saying. It's usually mm. like seven days of drinking straight, right? And then I like try and get back to my normal life after, and it's like takes a little takes a little longer. How late can we expect you to be out tonight? Ah, whatever it takes, man. Nice. Okay, I like to hear so that. So you're on vacation. You came here for. One I week came vacay? here, yeah, sort of yeah, vacation. I came here to uh, a buddy's fortieth, and also like pitch a show. Okay, working yeah. and vacation, working, working and, and partying. Good for you. So one of the questions we've asked this before: How long have you been down in LA now? Like four, seven five, years. Seven years. That's wild. I know, um, it's so crazy. So like, I, I know I've asked this, but I'm always fascinated by the idea of like people that make a big move like that. You know what I mean? You, like, like you said, all your friends and family are stationed either in Hamilton or Toronto, uh, and then you make this big professional leap. You've you've had success. You worked at Fox. You've worked at Amazon. You know what I mean? You write on a sitcom. Um, are there times where you're ever like, what am I doing down here? Or why did I go? Or have you been like, this was the right decision 10 times out of 10? It's usually more of a like when it's going to exile me, when I'm going to get kicked out of this town and get sent back <laughs> to Hamilton. That's what I always fear is like, you know, just it, like what happens if all the jobs dry up? I yeah. run out of money and I have to move back and move in with like my dad in Hamilton. Right. Outside of that. And I've been to places where I hated living there. Like I lived in like, a suburb of San Francisco, and I was super not into that whole scene. I went to UBC in Vancouver, and that was fun college years, but I wasn't really into the culture of Vancouver that much. Um, but LA, I've been 
if it lets me keep doing what I'm doing, it kind of, I might just be there forever. Even though when I come back here, I fucking love Toronto so much and it's like the best place ever. So and I, I still have, I still have that same fear here of like, yeah. Oh, it's all going to end. I'm going to have to move back in with my mom. Like totally. You might as well be in LA having those fears. Right. It's right. a longer trip, but yeah. yeah. Essentially, oh yeah. Right. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> what is it? A five hour flight? About a five hour flight. Right. Yeah. It's not so bad. what brought you out there? What, what uh, made you make the move well, to begin with? The biggest reason, like I was working here and I, I didn't get a job or I wasn't offered a job or anything. The biggest reason was I was a dual citizen. So I was born mm. in the States, so I could do it. Very easily. Much yeah. more easily than a Canadian. Way, way. It's yeah. so hard to and just, and you're, shot. you're smart to take yeah. advantage of it because yeah. there's a lot of people that were born, you know, like you're born in New York City, right? Yeah. People are always like, yeah, I could get my dual citizenship. It's like apply for it. I just feel like it's so hard to get a dual citizenship. Unless you were, bo- l- unless like you, you mean get like a visa or, or like yeah, a, sorry, a, a visa green card? to work there. Yeah, oh, it yeah, is, that, and yeah. it's yeah. expensive. Yeah. Like, I know people that have gone, like people that had were on O ones, having a blast, and then it didn't get renewed. Well, so that's the thing, right? Yeah, so they're temporary. So you move, yeah. you make this huge move across totally. to a new country for a job that might you might only be allowed to work for a year, two yeah. years maybe. Yeah, two years, and then you make all these friends, and you're living life, and you want to stay, yeah. and you get sent back to England or sent back to Canada. That happens, which is a huge bummer. You know, a green card's like at least 10,000 bucks plus so much work and like you got to prove why you deserve it. And the other thing too, but both of those is I could go there and work in a kitchen if I wanted to. I could go work like whatever I am just like to survive there. I could do those jobs, Mm -hmm. whatever it be to afford living there. But when you're on those visas, you have to stick to, I think, specialized field. You have to stick with your specialized field. So you can't work at a kitchen. You go in as a stand up comedian. They're not putting you on stage. I mean, you're not probably getting that much anyways as a stand-up. But oh you can't God. just – you can't really su- legally – so, so there's a lot of yeah. under-the-table jobs presumably going on. There are. Yeah. And there's, like, l- small loopholes. Like, I think one – like, f- for the stand-up, like, if you work uh, as a waitress at the comedy store, you can kind of be, like eh, – Both. I'm in the service I'm, I'm industry. Here. I'm doing the waitress to be a stand-up, and it's, like, mm-hmm. I'm in the service industry, so it's, like – you can kind of justify that. But did, so when you moved there, did you have a job lined up and that's why you left? Because no. you were working at Bell Media, which I mean. Go on. Well, they're very, uh, jobs inside this building are very hard to come by and quite competitive. Yeah. And you just left without a job? Yeah. Like I Bell knew, Media is like the top of the top in Canada, I would say. If I, not very close. For sure. And it was the best job I ever had. I probably ever will have. It was the best job Better ever. than your sitcom writing gig. You told that me job that. was pretty good. All right. That Don't job lie. was pretty good too. But it was pretty amazing. I never worked in a place where we were all buddies and we'd all go out together. And, like, that was such a rare form. Yeah. We've talked about, like, the closeness of our group and how yeah. special that was. Like, we haven't found it since that pocket of people. Well, there wasn't one asshole in the group. Yeah. And everybody was really, really good at what they did. It was and a we, talented group and a kind yeah. group. And usually really talented people can be at, like, competitive. Sometimes there's ego. Mm-hmm. Or, like, or yeah. like, sniping at each other or, yeah. like, backroom dealing. Everybody was just kind of, like, very open and, like, any competition was healthy. You always kind of wanted to see what kind of spot the other guy was doing or commercial mm-hmm. they were doing. But then ultimately you just wanted to, like, have drinks and make jokes. I feel like that's... Yeah, no, I agree. Mm-hmm. I think it was. It was, like, that healthy competition where you're, like, if someone did something great, you're, like, oh, man... Like, Veerman did that spot. It was so good. I wish I did that spot. Yeah. And it was like, I just think someone, I don't know who said this, but it was like, we we're getting paid to go to film school, essentially. Mm-hmm. We're yeah. learning to do all this stuff. Where? And we we're getting, like, here, we get here. budgets to make commercials. Oh, I see. So you were educating yourself project yeah. by project, is what you project mean? Project by project. We we're learning stuff, and learning how to use cameras, how to make money. stuff funny, and we were getting paid by it. And we had a wicked budget. Well, this is what I mean. And then you just left that for. And I know. I was honestly in something that I'd like, I have to at least go for it, give it a shot. Okay. My wife is also an actress as well, so she was on board as well because she do the actress thing there. Right. But the thing that like blew my mind, kind of what you're getting at too, is like no one gave a flying fuck about anything I did in Canada or my wife did in Canada. When yeah. you got to LA. When we got to LA, they did not. Care. They were like, I don't know what much music is. Like we kind of know what Degrassi is, but it's a full joke. <laughs> you could be the prime minister of Canada and go to the states and then be like, start start at the bottom. Yeah. You know? Wow. So, yeah, that was crazy. That was an eye-opener. So it took a lot to, like, kind of reinvent. Well, it was weird that you kept walking into every room and party holding your Promax Award. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> yeah. They were like, it kind of looks like an Oscar, but yeah. it definitely isn't you know an Oscar. That was the only thing that got me my job, my first job at FX. So they respect Promaxes. Promax, because that's international, and they right. saw my stuff at Promax. That's literally probably one of the only reasons, beside, like, a good reference, that I got that first job at FX. But I was 
just like PMing and PAing music videos for like Ariana Grande and stuff. Where up here you were directing major yeah. budgets. Well, for our listeners, a Pro Max is an industry word for commercial. So like if you see like a great commercial for like an ABC show uh, that like is like a shoot, it's like that will get entered into something the way that like the Emmys or the Oscars would. Mm-hmm. It's basically like a, I guess you would say, an Emmys for commercials. It's like those awards in Mad Men that you see. The Don Draper win. The Cleos, yeah. Don't you guys yeah. have them? As yeah. well? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. These guys got, Congrats. got yeah. bags. Of cl- wow. we, we got a few. It's what keeps us employed, to be honest. Because <laughs> <laughs> we've just been podcasting for the last little, yeah. Uh, but yeah, they're good. They're a good measure. You know, it's funny, awards in general, and I ask whenever we've done interviews, I always ask people, like, whether they've won a Grammy or been nominated for a Grammy, what awards mean. And I used to be very, like, um, I don't know, uh, philosophically sort of against awards. Like, maybe very much like, I, d- I just don't like, under- I, I don't know how you can sort of judge creative against other creative. And who are these people? Who are the judges? Who, who judges the judges? And what yeah. gives yeah. them the honor and this and that? I agree. But then, you know what I mean? You win. It might have been. Then you win one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, then you, then you win a few and you're kind of like, fuck yeah. And you, walk, you walk into the office, you're like, These come judges are- me now. <laughs> uh, no, what it was was uh, people talked about, I can't remember who pulled me aside. Maybe it was Randall or I don't know. I think it was, was Stockman. Maybe it was Justin. Yeah. It was your 100%. It was the pod father, our patron saint, Justin Stockman. He said to me, who's my mentor and, and now uh, you know, doing great things. He said to me, the reason that these awards are important, young buck, Mike Veerman, uh, is because if you can't measure, you need a metric to measure certain things. So it's like resume. You said that when you go, went down to LA and you started applying for jobs, they recognize the Promaxes. Right. You had a measuring stick. So it's like, if we have nothing to measure our industry against one another, how do people stand out? How do you sort of, so it's like, even if it's a flawed system, even if it's this weird construct, we need to have a system and that's the yeah. system for better or worse. And it's like, let's say winning isn't the be all end all. The five films that are nominated in the Oscars are usually amazing films. They're legitimately sure. great yeah. work, voted on by their peers, by the Academy. Yeah, so it's the like, only thing bullshit is the one that wins might not be the one necessarily that deserved to win. To your taste. Yeah. Right. But yeah. a nomination to any degree, Pro it's Max or an good. Oscar, yeah. is still like resume worthy. You can still slap that on a resume, and that's a universal measurement of the caliber of work you create. I think when you, and maybe you guys can both speak to this, I think when you get into like doing this sort of like commercial promo work that, that Shane and I do, it's like you're very hungry to win your first Pro Max because it's like your peers are winning them or whatever. And then once you get it, it's kind of a relief because you go, oh, I can stick that on a resume somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that was huge. Was like you win a couple, you're like, I'm going to LA right now. Well, <laughs> well yeah. no, for me it was the opposite. I've never felt like more of an imposter than winning a Pro Max. What did oh, you really? guys win for? Yeah. Can you tell? Oh, yeah. Good I did question. a spot, like it was the second spot I ever directed. And it, um, it was uh, with the cast of Pretty Little Liars. Oh, was it the oh, Pants cool. on Fire one? No, no, Randall did that. I pr- I produced that one though, which that was insanely like I've never been more stressed than. I'll never forget that. That that, that freaked me out because I didn't know what the fuck I was doing and I was up day and night trying to produce that. Now I know you have a thing called project managers. Yeah, man. I didn't know those existed. I was hiring our friend Dan Hamilton to cart around like props for that and he didn't know what the fuck he was doing. Oh my god, that was a nightmare. Uh, but, although he is good to hire for that stuff because he used to be a carny. I don't even oh, know if that works. Dan, that's coming in handy. He Dan worked for Hamilton checkers. saved my ass, and my friend who's like 78 years old right now named Burt Van Lerup saved my fucking ass. <laughs> Unsworth is leaving? Oh, no, he's getting a beer. <laughs> but, uh, I'll take a while. I'll, I'll, you make you. fun of Burt? I'm yeah. out of here. <laughs> yeah. But uh, it was a spot where the, the cast was involved, and it was, uh, it was a spot. I believe Simon Jane came up with the concept. It was where they were... Uh, Burning a tape or something? Is it that Yeah, one? they burn a tape in it. It was called Nothing to See Here. Yeah. And it actually won a world gold. Yeah. Like, not just like a local thing. And I was like, oh my God, oh my God, I'm going to get... Like, people are going to realize I'm an idiot because Randall was like, holy shit. And everyone was so <laughs> pumped about it. And then I got nervous to ever do anything again because it was like, oh, I'm on top. I can't... You should have quit. Yeah, exactly. Like, I felt like I was on such a pedestal at that moment. Yeah. 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 But really your work's been out. fantastic and consistent since. I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I think I think okay. the first two spots I did were the best spots I've ever done in my life. I'm that like, kind of happened to me, too. Yeah. Same thing. Like, the first couple ones I did were, like, some of the best stuff I've ever done, and then it was a slow uh, petering the out The more you there. learn, the more you realize how hard it is, almost. Yeah. Ignorance is almost a benefit when you start out if you can sort of knock a few out. Absolutely. With, Absolutely. It's like Absolutely. you don't know what you're doing right or wrong. You're yep. It's kind of like that punk rock approach where, like, it's like, it just comes kind of mm-hmm. off as... Not, I don't want to say genius, but like it comes off better because like you don't know that it's you're not supposed done to do that. Maybe, yeah. yeah. You guys were probably here during like the much music glory days, right? Like early 2000s. I mid? just it was already changing. Mike was here for the glory days. I was. And by the way, some would argue that the glory days were the 90s. Like that's when we all grew right. up watching much. Right. When I started working here, which was like my dream, like I I got in through a contest and like I got 
I was going to go to school and then I didn't. We've talked about this a lot on the pod. But like I ended up getting in and a lot of the guys that I became friends with, producers and stuff, I, I was literally a unit assistant. I worked four hours a day fetching coffees, all that shit. And those guys were all saying, you know, they were kind of saying like it was crazier in the old days. And then I was like, this is seems pretty fucking awesome to me. <laughs> yeah, I'm yeah, like, exactly. this is way, like I was I was a waiter at Swish LA. I'm like this. I'm in heaven. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. I'm like, if you guys are saying this is bad, I'm like, you guys are like, you're spoiled. But now yeah. cut to us all later. We're like. Man, it was good in the old well, days. No, the, yeah. the, the day I started, you were like, Shane, yesterday was amazing. <laughs> now things are different. When did you like, start? The day things became really shitty. So like 2008? <laughs> no, uh, uh, I believe it was uh, 2009. I honestly, like, I've, you heard, like, uh, you know, even when I started, like, you heard these people being like, oh, man, the 90s were crazy, dude. Like, right. people were doing coke off their desk and then what? being VJs. And they <laughs> would <laughs> say that. You'd hear stories like, like that. no Strombo? way. No, 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 no. This is okay. like way I back. I love Strombo. But Strombo's like, like... I would say it happened like once at a party. One guy did that once. And then, and then they, it was legendary. Now it's like, oh yeah, every day yeah. they're doing lines. Legend and of it. Making TV. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like, that never happened. Erica, as somebody that's trying to like... Um, you know, obviously you have an interest in working in this field. Mm-hmm. How do you see the landscape looking ahead as we're sort of people in the middle of our careers? Well, based on like what you guys are saying, like I think what it comes down to is like the money probably that exists in this field these days. And I know it's a lot different than it was a decade ago. I think at least. I think it's more or less than it was. Oh, I think it's less. I think it might be more. I think it might be more. It's just different. And there's more opportunity for someone like you. Why? Because uh, content and media has never been more sought after. You're right. So I guess. (laughs) (laughs) That was easy. (laughs) Well, no, I guess I'm, I'm thinking more, I guess like, yeah, you're right. It's changed. Mm-hmm. It's just it's just changed. It's, it's just I the paradigm has shifted. It's so like so dinosaurs television. like us think differently. Whereas you're more on the cusp of what's hot. Right. Where would you work if you could choose right now anywhere? Where would you work in Toronto? In Toronto. Well, I I work um, also at MLSE. Far. I really like sports media. I really she do. She actually works. Okay. She works with my brother. Spread, right? yeah. Yeah, yeah. 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 God bless his soul. <laughs> I love Craig Beerman. Um, Me too. Yeah, I don't know. Silence. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I feel, love him. I love him okay. also. Honestly, yeah, this is awesome. this is really um, sort of uh, what I've been my new outlook on life from Vancouver gave me. When I was out there, there's like no industry other than like the cafe and bar scene. Like all my friends who are educated, who live there to go live like the fun skier lifestyle, are like working at cafes and restaurants, and that's what they want to be doing right now. And they're so happy, and they've never been more fulfilled. I can tell. But I was just so happy to come back here and like, honestly, to like be in sports media and then hang out in Bell Media sometimes. Like, So what gave you perspective kind of was how shit it was out there. The shrooms. <laughs> <laughs> no, <laughs> no, no. Um, it, it's just so different. Like, I don't know. I mean, I obviously wasn't there to work and to see what like the mm-hmm. landscape is like over there. But I guess I just saw like a small glimpse of what my friends are doing and... I don't know. I just feel like I feel like I'm doing exactly what if you told me a year ago I would be doing now what I'm doing. I like wouldn't have believed you to be yeah. quite honest. Sounds I like feel you're pretty so good. What are you doing at, exactly though? What do you mean? Like what are you doing? I, like, like, I describe yeah. it to people like I just say like, oh, I'm freelancing right now. I have like mm-hmm. a couple of things kind of on the go. I help like assistant produce a podcast that's produced by like that's presented by like the much creative studio. And it's like I honestly wouldn't have believed you if you told and me this. This is like your side. Is that date. correct? No, it's correct. I oh, was okay. gonna say I felt like I felt like you were you were gonna say like Max Kerman or Kel. That's right. I thought you. Was that's say the that. nice card in the door. I was I just thought you were avoiding it because he's not here and you don't want to be rude to us. No, no, I don't. I mean, that's also like you work with Shane and the boys. Exactly. <laughs> I work with Shane and Mike. <laughs> Wait, um, Shane Cunningham? Yeah. The Shane Cunningham? <laughs> <laughs> From the 10 year ago Pretty Little Liar spot? But <laughs> <laughs> One time Promax winner? Yeah, Promaxers. Oh, I guess when you guys were like in the glory day, so to speak. Uh, by the way, can I say that mm. I, I will say this and it sounds like we are like, I do feel like these are the glory days too. Like I actually feel like these are good days. They I've heard are. you say that before. What's that? I've yeah. heard you say that before many a time. I do I say it you. all the time. Like it, honestly, like I keep people always talk about like a prime or like uh, like the best time of their life. And some people it's it's high school, and some people it's like the early twenties. Some people peak late and it's their forties or whatever it is. I keep saying like I'm I feel so lucky because there's times where I feel like I'm in this weird extended prime where I'm just mm-hmm. like I remember being twenty five and having so much fucking fun and being like 
these are the days, man. Like, we'll remember. Th-. And then it's like a decade later. It's yeah. like, I'm so excited to go have beers with you tonight and your last night in Toronto. And I'm like, I just, there's always something to look forward to. And I don't take for granted for one second that it's like just as good as it was then. It's just, we change. Like, I'm different. Mm-hmm. But totally. I still, I still re- recognize that this is like a weird, we always joke about how Max is like living a blue checkmark life. Like, we're yeah. very lucky to sort of orbit in a weird space where we get all these crazy experiences. And it doesn't go unappreciated by me because it's like... Yeah. I, well, I, I'm nostalgic I mean. about right now, right now. That's funny. You know what I mean? Like I'm right. and, oh, and I, I I'm still very nostalgic about the the old days yeah. too. And I always think the old days are a little bit better than they are right now, but I also think now is still awesome and something to like appreciate. That's awesome. I mean, they they say this like uh, nostalgia is a negative emotion mm-hmm. or whatever. It's like how you deal with if you're not liking what you're doing now, you're looking back and kind of getting through now because going into the past. And it was like originally like a, a mental symptom. Like they're like, this guy has nostalgia. He's suffering from nostalgia. Oh, and yeah. then it became this like positive thing. But like, yeah, I totally agree with you too. It's like, I think there was like a thing in the end of the office. It was like, I wish you could know the good times when you're in the good times or whatever. Yeah. But that's the way I feel too. It's like, these are good times. These are the I'm good times. I'm not looking back and be like, those were the peak. Those are the times. Like, no, I'm having a blast right now. I think we also forget the anxieties we had then. So it's like when, when we're course. talking about like, man, remember when we were all like, we, we think about when all of us were like hanging out a decade ago doing much stuff or whatever. And like, how is this great crew? And it was, but we also, you, you conveniently forget any anxieties you had, like, or mm-hmm. it's like the, the insecurities that you have as a younger person. Do you know what I mean? And that's why like, I try to empathize with anybody at any stage in their life. Cause I'm like, I'm like, Oh, right. I remember like, what did I feel like a lot of anxiety about like, am I going to keep this yeah. job or am I going to get a job? And because I've been in a, in a job, mm-hmm. I mean, in 2012 is when I came Came back when you left um so i'd been here and then our band got a record deal with universal um and then the band thing didn't work out but i was gone for two years like i was living in my my oma my grandmother's basement and i my savings were gone and i was well into my line of credit and it's like whenever i try to have empathy for anybody that's like looking for work or stability or trying to like find her place in like a creative industry i'm like i remember how like scared shitless I was that I was like I blew it I went to do this band thing one of these unicorn jobs isn't going to open up again blah 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 and then you know Unzi decides to leave for LA and (laughs) my phone rang I got an email I was Mm -hmm. like well shit that's like perfect timing you know and like I don't know if I believe in any sort of higher power or tapestry of the universe but it's like those things tended to come along at the exact right time which was nice I to that point like I have like quite anxiety too especially related to work and like I always try to just think in like the height of it like if I had no self-doubt like what could I accomplish because sometimes I feel like I am like my own biggest like barrier but like I like here I feel like nothing but support from like all of you guys all the Mm -hmm. time I feel like you guys are such an outlet that I can like grow as much as I'd like to here same with my other job and like sometimes I just think the only thing in my way is my own self Sorry to get so deep all of a sudden on a Wednesday night. But, but like self, I'm serious. self doubt totally can be path, good though, yeah. because it fear can, is it, a huge motivating, awesome. It's factor. hard. To, yeah, it's hard because there's some people that have no self self doubt and they crush it, mm-hmm. and then other people like it might like keep cripple you, in check. you from taking well, the next fear jump. that f- fear that's uh, crippling to get started sucks. Right. Fear that's making you worried about fucking it up is actually I look at it as a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. It's, but if you can't can, even can. if you can't even get to the 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 workplace, that's that's horrible. That's yeah. actually a right. debilitating thing. Yeah, yeah. But I think you that's a healthy amount of fear to have. I think it sucks when you don't have that fear and you're like that cliche uh, millennial who's just overly confident or uh, self entitled. Right. But you have that good level, and you're like I don't want to say your age, but you're like what twenty three. Yep. Greg and I didn't even like your boss right now. Didn't even go to college till we were 25. <laughs> we don't graduate that college hypothetically till we're 28. Think about that. I know. Like yeah. that's a huge head start you have just getting a foot in the door. Right. And I'm so grateful. And you have well, a good. I, I, you have thank a good you guys. I don't want it to come across as I'm not. No, no, no. no I'm not saying, saying it so you keep saying you're so grateful because here's the thing. This is the other thing. It always feels slow. Like progress feels slow when you're in it. You're right. So like from our perch, we're like 23. You're ahead of the game. But for you, you're going shit. Mm-hmm. When's it going to happen or whatever? And or that's like, the way it should or be. Will I be it fired should. tomorrow? Yeah. Like literally, am I going? It is like it's once you have something to lose that like fear of losing it sometimes is overwhelming. Mm-hmm. Is what I yeah. mean by like the fear yeah. of like I am my own biggest hurdle. But you know, working on it. Working on it. Yeah. 
feeling supported, feeling great by these steam whistles. We're at 40 minutes, you guys, at this <laughs> recording so we far. Even got What's the time? So <laughs> Brad Pitt or Leo? <laughs> 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 um, well, I, 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 do you guys want to move into topics or just sure. keep rolling? I mean, uh, I'll do anything, man. Yeah, uh, I guess uh, I, to wrap this up because I do think this is a fascinating co- uh, uh, conversation, and I'm interested because obviously, Matt, you're like a self starter. You're somebody that has like accomplished things, and you're very DIY in a lot of ways. I find like with you've had things go viral. What was that thing you had where it's like deal with it or whatever? Uh, it was, like, the, the robot captcha thing. The ro- the thing yeah. that could beat the captcha. The ro- yeah. yeah. It's like that, you you sort of create all these things. You're always well, we got to explain creatively. what that is though. So Please do know. somebody Shane anyone. Uh, uh, so on Reddit, Reddit on yeah. Reddit there is uh, any. Anytime you want to do a post, you have to get past this thing to prove that you're not a robot. And you basically just click a button that says, I am not a robot. I think it's like when you buy concert tickets and stuff like that, too. Like they're the, all over the place. Yeah. Also that. I, I noticed it first on uh, actually even doing a post on Reddit, which is where you posted this to Reddit. And, but you actually built a robot <laughs> to click the mouse to prove that the robot is not a robot which of course is beating the system and then the robot does that thing where those animated glasses come down and the the the, the joint goes in its <laughs> yeah. mouth and it what song it plays it says deal with it it's like a dog song yeah yeah and it, that got what seven million views uh it's currently at 15 million views. that's insane so you've probably made eighteen thousand dollars off this clip. i would have if i didn't have to split it with snoop Dogg. the song royalty how much does Snoop get? Half. What? Because so you, I put that song in for like five seconds, oh he gets half God. of all the money. If you were to do it again, would you just have someone make a sound alike? You know what, though? It's hard to say because I don't think it would have been as funny Because the song it. sells yeah. it. So I, that's what fun. I was getting I, at. I have no regrets putting that song So do they at least recognize you for doing that meme in the States? But do, uh, Is that on your I have resume? used it on resumes before, really? for sure. It's very interesting. Well, it's, it's I'm awesome. not sure if it I mean, worked so or smart. not, but I have used it. Because you can just say like it got 15 million hits. Exactly. I and feel like they anywhere. see numbers and they're like, oh, okay, it checks out. Like and you've also made uh, s- Sloots Off Instagram? Yeah, Sloots Off Instagram. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, yeah, yeah. That's how you pronounce it. James. So basically, obviously, uh, that's Sluts of Instagram. <laughs> but you found a loophole by changing the way it's pronounced. So you made this website and then created this whole like uh, fantasy, fantasy world with all these backstories. Has this one that- aged well, by the way? I don't know. I always kind of <laughs> question that. It wasn't that long ago. Well, you know, the term isn't... Uh, and it'll incorrect. pop up every once in a while and go, like, apeshit bananas, and then I'll, like, check in on yeah. it again. But, but Instagram basically tried to give you a, a cease and desist letter. Yeah, they sent me a cease and desist letter. And you were like, no, no, you don't understand. This is a character sleuths off, and he <laughs> runs this magical world. And, like, this is his name. You can't, like, say that this is sluts of yeah. because this is sleuths off. Right. <laughs> This, by the way, this podcast will be Exhibit A in the uh, <laughs> litigation. But no, it's a great defense because you legitimately created a solid enough case it's where they uh, had to back off, right? The story of a magical duck named Slutsoff living in a land called Stagram. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, yeah. And, but they were like, you can't use the word Instagram inside of .com or we'll sue you because we own all that stuff. And, and you I was continue like, you, can't, you don't own the al- alphabet. You can't say like, what la- letters can line up. And they backed off. Wow. <laughs> I just pictured their lawyers at like Instagram he- headquarters. They're like, it's true. We don't own the uh, alphabet. Uh, looks like this guy's got a case. <laughs> <laughs> He's got us. Yeah. Stargram, that's smart. Uh, but my question was going to be, you, you, I think what Eric was speaking to, the sort of self-doubt that creatives have or like, well, how did you, how did you deal with those anxieties? Because you're somebody that's sort of like, you came out of high school, like you said, you went to college in, in BC, but you kind of always kind of navigated your way back door wise, I feel like. Yeah, a lot of scheming involved. Uh, I think it's sort of what Shane was saying too, is just like having that self doubt. It's hard to mm-hmm. tell if it helps you or hinders you or not, but at least it's like you're self criticizing first before you do anything. And there's been a million other little attempts that nothing happened of them. And then you're like embarrassed and you take it off YouTube or, or whatever that thing is. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I think it's just like, I think all of you guys, I mean, look, you guys, you guys were both part of the applying as a contest yeah. right. person from Hamilton, right? And like, just, just take big swings, just taking a big swing and got there. I got this, I, I got this job on like a complete fluke almost. I had a friend that worked in the building. She, your original much job, original much job when I was on the TV side and she ridged, like she was the one who pulled my resume out of the garbage can. 
And, it was uh, literally in a garbage it can. It was in the garbage can. She was she looking for it. food. <laughs> <laughs> and she's like, you have she's to. She's really hungry. I was like, have they seen a resume yet? She's like, uh, not exactly. It's in the garbage can. <laughs> Oh um, wait! So you asked, like you're like, how, like so how, why was she pulling resumes sure, out of the garbage? Uh, so uh, Antonella, who yep. worked here, she was like my reference, and she was like uh, probably one of the biggest reasons I got this job. And she like, che- I think, I'm pretty sure she checked at Johnny K's desk if my resume was there, and it was like in the garbage can. And she was like, "Give this another read. I think you'd be like a good person to work here." Holy shit! And he did. And then. I had all this stuff like souped up semi lies about like my background in TV and stuff. Like I'd done some documents, documentaries and stuff. Some tasteful new You milk modeling. it a little bit. Yeah. yeah, you milk it though. You make it sound way bigger than it is. But it was my uh, first job in Hamilton working at my dad's corporate video uh, channel. Like corporate video company where you mm-hmm. make like corporate videos and bad like infomercials and stuff. Yeah. And Johnny K was like, he, sorry, Johnny K was like ran much music for a long time. Yeah. And Johnny K was like, listen, kid. I have so many film and TV students coming in here wanting to make their artwork and wanting to like do all these crazy things and short films. Like, frankly, I think it's working here is similar to just working at a corporate video place. And he's like, I think it would actually kind of work. You're not gonna be busting my balls to like do your next biggest thing. Like, I think you could just like work here in that. And like, it was the bottom of my resume. And like, that was kind of the reason he hired me here. Well, wow. that's interesting. Yeah. So I guess the overall message before we get into our topics is uh, fight through the insecurities and the anxiety and have confidence in yourself. Uh, but I think it's good to be aware of your own limitations in some ways. And then the goal is to fight through those. And like, if you want to make something cool and creative, just fucking do it. That's what we say all the time. People, I'm sure people ask yeah. you all the time for advice, right? Because you're like in the industry, like people will constantly ask Shane and I, and it's always just like, be kind, like honestly, like just be, be nice. Like people want to work with good people and Make shit. Don't wait for someone yeah. to give you a budget That's to make for shit. Sure. Like you have to just go do it, even if it looks like shit on YouTube. Well, the key is to care, and that I look at that as a synonym for worrying. So if you're worrying, you're caring. Right? You're right. So the, yeah. all you have to do is care. Like an unhealthy amount of worrying isn't going to get you anywhere. But yeah. if you care a ton, you're going to do well. Eventually, totally. Yeah. Yeah. No matter yeah. what. Yeah. All right. So we, I feel like we went, uh, we went a little deep. Uh, maybe people enjoyed that. Maybe they didn't. I don't know. Uh, maybe we're missing Max to, to bring it back to, to a more uh, focused place. But we are now going to go to the topics. So let's start with uh, Shane Gillis uh, of, or formerly of SNL. Uh, this was a big story uh, this past week because SNL last week announced three new cast members, uh, one of them being their first uh, Asian cast member in the history of the show, which in some ways it seems kind of crazy that it's been on the air for whatever it is, 40 years plus. Yeah. Gay Asian. Yes, but yeah. they have had gay cast members in the past. Um, but yeah, it's it's kind of wild. Uh, but that is the fact. One of the other people that they announced was this guy, Shane Gillis, uh, who is a Philly stand-up comedian who also does sketch work. And he uh, he was announced, so all on the same day that these three cast members were announced, the other uh, woman that was announced is like a sort of a sketch person. I'm not sure what her back, uh, her like sort of history is, is in performance. But these are the three that were announced. And within hours of it being announced, someone had gone online and found uh, a video of Shane Gillis's past podcast. I guess he had a podcast these last like couple years, uh, and this was from 18 months ago. There's a clip of him using uh, derogatory uh, words, racist words, uh, to describe Asian people. They're kind of having this conversational thing. I don't know if it's a bit. He, they're talking about Chinatown, uh, but it's just like he irrefutably uses. Uh, language that you cannot use and just sort of shows the flippant nature within in which they would sort of talk about these things so this gets posted online people are like this is the guy that snl hired and in like sort of a a sad ironic twist snl was taking a bit of a victory lap for sort of being celebrated for hiring their first asian cast member and then the other guy they hired is on the record saying something racist uh toward asians so we all were on like the group chat, like in the, the pod thing. And I was like, this is a wild story. I'm like, does he last till the weekend? People had different, like, they were like, I don't think so. He's going to be done. It was like, if anybody's going to maybe like go against the grain, maybe Lauren Michaels would be like, well, people say things in the past, whatever. But on Monday or Tuesday, he was let go from his job at SNL. So just as quickly as he was hired, he was fired. Uh, yeah, this is kind of polarizing. People like Rob Schneider, former SNL cast member, has been, he's defended uh, Shane Gillis. Other comedians have sort of been like, well, you can't say anything anymore and you lose a job. Other people have taken the stance that it's like, I don't like the idea that uh, 
people are trying to get people fired just because they have opposing views. Other people are saying, listen, this is fucking racist. There's no like ifs, ands, or buts but about it. It's weird with that Rob Schneider would do that because he took out a full page ad to disparage um, Mel Gibson after he made anti Semitic comments. Yeah, sure. Right? So it's like, and he was like, I will never work with. Uh, not that he was really in the running to work with Mel Gibson, but he, <laughs> he, he said, I will never work with Mel Gibson. And he made that quite known. That might be the funniest thing Rob Schneider has ever <laughs> said. From this point on, I refuse to work with an Oscar caliber actor. <laughs> He's out of the animal too. Yeah. <laughs> Although now Mel might be up for animal. Yeah. They might have to find each other at this point just to get something made. But I, I, I find it odd the things that, People will take an extreme on, and then they'll go the exact opposite. You're so, talking about the hypocrisy of it all, right? And I feel like there is definitely a, a, a hierarchy of racial slurs, and I feel like the C word is a little bit lower on the list than the N word. And I'm very curious to see how this would have played out had it been the N word and not the C word. He would have got fired quicker, you think? Much, much quicker, and there would be way less uh, comedians defending the free speech thing. That's a that's a very fascinating angle, and I think that that's why people are kind of upset that it took this long. Unzi, what are your thoughts? Uh, yeah, I think he said the f word too. I think he did like a pretty offensive like string of things going on. I like mean, I think the lot- f word for gay people. Yeah, right. But I think that like in these times, there's so much conversation of like I don't know what to do in this scenario and that scenario, and like how do we handle a society and people looking for like a blanket law or rule what you can and can't do these days. And this stuff is so complicated that you're like, no, it has to be case by case basis. Yeah. And for him, you know, if it was, if he had done that 50, if he said that stuff 15 years ago and he made the argument, it's like, yeah, I'm a changed person. I was stupid in my early twenties. I made a mistake and I did some stuff and I've learned from that. And if he had learned from that, he might have had a case in a scenario. Yeah. But or, that was or a year ago. Even so though, I think uh, just to take it even a less extreme approach if, if let's say this was eight months ago, but he was on stage in the confines of a, a stand-up club and he was trying out material that was clearly a joke, maybe in poor taste, that just kind of bombed, but he was trying to joke. This was a conversation that he was seemingly giving his actual thoughts yeah, on Chinatown. Totally. It Wait, and like and everyone's bit. like, it was a, he's a comedian, therefore everything a comedian says is a joke, and every place a comedian speaks is a playground to test out material. It's like, no, he was just speaking on a podcast talking about Chinatown and saying, yeah, that's where the C-words go. That's where the C-word should stay. It's like, what? That's crazy. Yeah, 100%. So there are always, always different cases. For this one, it's like, no surprise he got fired. Because wasn't, he wasn't doing a, I don't, I mean, it doesn't sound like he was doing a bit. He was just being like super ignorant and being okay with it. Yeah. Do you remember uh, like 15 years ago, Sarah Silverman on Conan, she had a bit about uh, trying to get out of jury duty. And she's like, uh, it's really easy to get out of jury duty. You have to be just racist. So I, I, the people who asked me to be on jury duty, I said, I can't do it, unfortunately. Uh, I hate C words. And then she and then she asked her friend about sending that message and they were like, no, that's too racist. She goes, OK, I, I'll say I love C words. <laughs> and then that was the workaround. That's but, a funny term. But you can see yeah. you can see the joke there. Right. But, but she can't use the word. Right. But the big thing on Conan was they didn't beep. The C word. Wild. She just said that straight out on Conan? On Conan. Just, you Holy know, crap. 15 out, years ago. Unbeat. Okay. And that Wild. was fine. And then she went on Bill Maher and they had uh, uh, some representative who's like, why would you beep the N word but not the C word? Why is there this disparity between the two racial slurs? It was very hard they to They asked Sarah Silverman this. Yeah. And she, she willingly went on. Uh, it was called Politically Incorrect was the show. I remember it. And she addressed this. Yeah. And what did she say? I, I can't remember, but I, I remember it being, what? Come on. I, I'm supposed to remember everything, Erica. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Erica She's a you fucking the idiot. Question. You built oh, up I'm to it. Saying, yeah, you remember like the very telling question, but you don't remember what she said? No, no, because it was a conversation. I remember the joke, but I don't remember the conversation. There was a lot of stuff going back and forth. You. Sorry. I'm grateful to be here. Girl sees a mountain once. She knows everything. <laughs> <laughs> Train museum. Yeah. <laughs> my, my bad. <laughs> yeah. But point is, I feel like this is ground that was covered 15 years ago. And even then it was deemed like inappropriate, even yeah. in the confines of a joke. You for know sure. What I mean? This is, yeah. Like he would have gotten fired 15 years ago, probably for that. Right. You think? I, yeah, I think, I, mean, I think it would be debatable, but now it's, it's not even really debatable, which surprises me that so many comedians are fighting for this 
to be like reversed or it's just saying how ridiculous this yeah you is. almost sit this one out because it's yeah. like it wasn't a it's like if you use the word within the last like 18 months like if you use the word you're kind of out like that's that seem that doesn't seem like a, a crazy rule because this kind of got confused with a lot of things where it's like this cancel culture culture is getting crazy and it's like now look here's the latest victim it's like well no he's like it's it's a really shitty thing like to use that word in this day and age and what does it say about your judgment or just like your flippant nature when it comes to using racial slurs it, i guess like so it's like it doesn't seem that crazy to me. It doesn't feel like that much of a debate. It's just like, no, you can't go on a nationally televised institutional show in America if you've used that word. Like, them's the rules. Like, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. But maybe they're not the rules to some people. But I think maybe you can if it was on a comedy stage where it's like, here's the joke. Like, even if he did that Sarah Silverman joke and it was like, that is completely inappropriate. You cannot do that. You are not Asian. You don't have the right to use that word. Like, you don't know what it's like. You're so ill-informed, but it, but it's a joke. It's and a bit. It's clearly a bit. Where he's created right. a character that's I think using the, the word. I think for the a fact that it was just a conversation yeah, and it actually seemed like he was saying his real thoughts. And unless I, this was totally plucked out of context, and I'm just seeing it, and I'm thinking these are his real thoughts, but they're not. Then it's it's not even a question of whether he should be removed or not, which is why it's so shocking to me that so many comedians are saying he's a comedian don't you get jokes this is how jokes are formulated this is how we kind of sharpen the blade we fail and we fail and we fail until we succeed and figure out the the, the root of the comedy but right. it, to me it wasn't that this isn't the hill to die on for sure exactly do you, do you think that there's a whole like like let's say one of us got an snl like one of the four of us do you yeah. think that there would be somebody that would go through all of our tapes and try to like or do you think he had like a, a a group of people that already felt like he was sort of a racist, problematic comedian? I, I came ac across a clip of me the other day from like maybe three years ago when I first met Alex. And she, I was filming her and she kind of fell <laughs> down a hill. That's how you guys met? <laughs> no, no. It was like, Why were you filming her walking around a hill? <laughs> no, because I was like... So she's like, pretty. No, honestly, Who's I was that? like, I was like, oh, I can't believe Alex is with me. I'm so happy. I have this girlfriend. I'm filming her at every moment, just like Insta bragging, like, oh, here's yes. here's my new girlfriend, everyone. And then she fell down a hill. And then and then I was like, oh well, I'll just find another. And then I said like a very rude word for a woman. Mm. And I was like, holy shit! Like, I hate that I did that. I understand I was joking and trying to be extreme or shocking. But this was only three years ago. I was like, if I was to see that now, I'd be like, maybe this guy doesn't even deserve to go on SNL. You know what I mean? Yeah. At least I was joking. That's my only way to justify it. And I was playing a kind of douchebag character within this very small seven second clip. That yeah. That's the way I kind of justify it. Yeah. But I really hate the guy in that clip. You know what I mean? Yeah. Totally. That would even do the joke to be the douchebag. It's, it's, it's so weird like how quickly you can kind of come to a point of realization i don't know if it's like oh, i'm a dad now and i'm fucking pushing 40 but at that time it didn't even seem like anything to just kick out to my entire like social media universe have you since taken it down no it, it, it was a um, like a story it was it was actually a snap yeah but yeah and maybe the nature of the snap made me feel a little bit more uh inclined to do so but sure it would get away eric what were you gonna say i'm just surprised there's not a business for this yet anyone who wants to go into politics media this that hire someone to deep dive all of your social media anything you've There's ever both. put yeah. in the internet so so there is yeah. he scrubbed, yeah. he scrubbed everything and why why isn't it a multi-million dollar industry melissa no, no, no. <laughs> via senor deleted uh, over 2100 tweets the day before she got hired at snl this this guy scrubbed all of his podcasts shane gillis scrubbed his pods so but how did it well, think about how much media floats around. Say you have an Erica that puts together your video for the pod. You might have a copy of the pod. So we scrape it from the internet. Mm -hmm. But if, if you're like, actually, I have a clip of Mike and Shane saying something oh. inappropriate. Like, it's just, there's going to be media floating around. I don't know how this little clip exists. Oh, he's a stand-up comedian. There's so much jealousy going on there. The second someone sees like that, who's they, one of your haters, they say they're it. like alley-oop. And they just scoop it up and they just save it for when you finally make That's it. That's a great point. It's not even the people that have the extraneous media. It's the people that will go, that could be, save I'll it. I'll save that for later. Yeah. 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 The listener who, yeah. Mm -hmm. Exactly.
the highs and lows of that guy's 48 hours must have been completely insane. You and I were texting about yeah. this. Well, Dear and Lord. then you posted, uh, not posted, you sent this in a text group, this crazy skit that I'm so dumb, I didn't even check the date on it. I thought he had d- done this after the fact. No, it was just randomly, like, a while ago he did it. Mike, describe the skit that was released in 2018. So, uh, Unzi sent to the pod group today this this sketch that was done. I couldn't believe it. I thought they did it over the weekend to address... Did you have the, the same thought? Yeah, that's what I was just saying. So, this there's this sketch starring Shane Gillis, who's going by his namesake, and it opens up... Did you watch this, Erica? Oh, you weren't in the group. So, they, so basically, the sketch... <laughs> oh, sorry. My bad. Kick her while she's yeah, down. Oh, that one hurt. Yeah. <laughs> no amount of beautiful mountains will <laughs> heal that. No, it's all yours. Is that it for the drinks? What's that? Talking to the mic for your talk. Why did you say get 12 short cans? You specified short cans. I don't I, like tallies. Tallies get warm by the bottom. I, I get that. I agree, but why wouldn't you have said, I don't know, 18? Listen, we're going to wrap this up real quick. Trust me. Leo <laughs> I got to pee really too long. <laughs> uh, so this sketch uh, essentially is Shane Gillis. There is a He's a fireman that just saved a whole family from a burning building. And... The news is there to cover this heroic feat, and um, immediately, like, sort of, as he's giving the interview, it starts to come out that this, like, they look at his social media, and he has, like, a MAGA hat on, like, make America great again. It's like, this firefighter, who was a hero two seconds ago, is shown to be problematic. It's literally, like, the embodiment of what happened to him with his SNL experience. And when did this get come out again? A year ago. Oh, my God. Maybe he made it a year ago, and, like, it's been sent around right now. And it's just like, yeah, it's like, it's just... This fireman and like people just like his old friend calls in and starts saying about how they're like doing drugs the night before and all this stuff. It just starts making Tarnishing. him look bad. Tarnishing exactly. his thing. And it's like, on, like a word the for honor word. which he just earned. And in the yeah. span then, of the yeah. three, and, and it turns out he's racist. He said that because the family he saved was Hispanic. So then it's like he's said things racist in the past. And Whoa. then within the three minutes of the sketch, he ends up getting fired by the fire chief. Uh, and then it's like the camera or sorry, the news reporter really delights in the fact that they sort of propped this guy up and tore him down and fired him. It's actually... It's a pretty I, funny sketch. I think it's very good, and I think it's it's a thoughtful sketch, and it's an interesting sketch that's probably worthy of more conversation and nuance in the sense that, like, maybe what SNL saw in this guy uh, is that he was thinking in sort of a way that is fascinating because it's a good sketch it is I like I can't deny that like go look at it on air it, it's an interesting sketch and I imagine that the reason SNL hired this guy is because they're like he might be someone that leans right or has like a different view and this show seems to be full of people leaning left or like super progressives mm-hmm. and, and Lorne Michaels has said he wants balance he doesn't want to seem like you know a wing of one of the parties so I, I, I would guess that that sketch sort of sums up why they were interested in this guy they go he's an alter, alternate voice and the sketch like brought up really good like sort of fascinating points about the way, like I said, we lift people up and tear them down. So the sketch exists, uh, and it's just eerie how close it was to the fucking weekend this guy had. Crazy. It's wild. Like if you're trying to get on SNL, would you say, I have a podcast and I might have said some weird things. Like he might not even remember saying that. But but here's the thing. It always feels disingenuous because in the seat of in the back of anyone's mind hearing this, they're going to think you're only doing this for self-preservation. But let's say he had done a podcast where it was like a very special episode. And he said, okay, I have a little bit of self-reflection. In the past eight months, I have said the C word. I do not know why I said this. I guess it was I was trying to be shocking. And although it didn't seem like I was kidding, I do use this podcast to test boundaries and test my material to some degree. And I let things come about in an organic way through conversation. And I regret saying those things. And then let's say four months pass and he gets this SNL opportunity. Shit hits the fan and all that's highlighted is this C word moment. He would say, hey, I actually had a come to light moment much before I was even hired at SNL. Here's this clip. If you, if you don't believe me, you don't believe me. But on, honest to goodness, this is the way I feel now. And I'm very humiliated right now. I think he would have had a 50% better shot of staying at SNL. As is, he played it like I'm a comedian who pushes boundaries. You think that's bad? I failed time and time and time again. You're going to find a lot of bad stuff about me. So this is just how it works to be a comedian, and this is the type of comedian I am. And it just came off very poorly in in the way I looked at it because I was like, you're looking at that as some joke you were testing out and not just some bullshit conversation you had that made you come across as extremely prejudiced. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
So I feel like that was his only scapegoat. If you have an amazing opportunity and then all of a sudden you start backpedaling and explaining it, it doesn't feel as, you know, the opposite of disingenuous. So he... he Genuous? He tried to explain himself after it had broken. And he, did, and he didn't even... He was, he was not... He doesn't think it's wrong. He, he feels he, like he's being persecuted. He said, if... I will apologize to anyone who's genuinely offended. And then people were like, I'm offended, I'm offended. And then he reached out and was like, oh, well, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that's fair. I don't know, man. Weird times. One of the things that I thought about a lot, which I was saying that Unzi and I were texting about, was I just thought about him as like a human being, whether you think he's reprehensible or not. I was like, this guy just found out he's going to be on SNL. They're announcing it in The Hollywood Reporter and, you know, a variety and it's like all of his friends and family are like, holy shit, dog, you got SNL. I assume they say dog. Uh, and it's like, uh, it's like, this is huge. Like the highest professional moment of his career. And within two hours, he immediately was a national story about this. It, it must be the highest like of highs and the lowest of lows where he went like, this, w- this felt good for two hours. And then I immediately got terrified waiting for my agent to like, get back to me about a conversation they're waiting to hear back from Lauren Michaels. It's like, like what a crazy roller coaster of emotion, you know? And, and like, obviously we can agree, uh, agree or disagree whether it's deserved or not. I'm just more fascinated in the human experience that that guy must've mm-hmm. sort of went through what a wild sort of swing in, in a couple hours. Totally. Mm-hmm. Yeah. On that topic, did you just hear the prime minister thing that just happened? No. He got caught, uh, like blackface. It's like <gasps> a Rambian night. Where Justin was, Trudeau. Was I was just in the bathroom. I ran down because that one's getting painted. This one's getting cleaned. And it was like a live thing where it was like Justin Trudeau. Justin Trudeau is getting painted blackface? right now in blackface. <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no. He no. was like, in, like at a party as like Arabian How night. How long ago? I don't know. But it, uh, the timing of these things is fascinating. Like, listen, at the end of the day, like, we'll see what happens with this. But it's like, as we're going into an election, it's just such fun. It's like, have they been sitting on this? Like, if this is from like a decade ago, how long have, have whoever released it been sitting on it? Mm-hmm. We'll see how it goes. I mean, especially like if you run on like a progressive ticket, it's like you can't. It's tough, man. Yeah. Do you ever get worried about how tanned you're getting? <laughs> <laughs> yes, every day when everyone says it. Okay, to wrap this up, just to honor our our, our producer and, and beautiful friend who we love and, and adore, Max Kerman. I'm going to go around the table here. Uh, Brad or Leo? Here's here's the thing. It's 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 more complicated than it would seem. <laughs> oh, it is. It is. Jeez. I just quick, wanted us all yeah, to give yeah. a here's, name and get the fuck why. out of here. Here's my sweet spot for actors. 35 to 45. That's when I love them. That's when I feel like they produce the best work. And right now it's Leo, but before it was Brad. Brad or Leo? I did a lot of research today at the end of the day. Brad because Thelma and Louise is my third favorite movie of all time. Ooh, pretty good. And that's Didn't Brad that in his prime. That blows my mind that you even know Thelma and Louise exist. I've seen like four movies, and, <laughs> <laughs> and the ones I have seen are. You've seen that good. one four times. Yeah. I've seen that all-time favorite movie, Forrest Gump. I think it should be on the pedestal. Yeah. Okay. We will Ooh, do it. Do that's that would be a great pedestal movie, by the way. Mm-hmm. Anzi, well, Brad or Leo? After calling out Max and Max being like, "Do do some research. Look it up. Read some interviews. <laughs> Use your brain. <laughs> Use your brain." <laughs> Did a lot of thinking. I'm gonna go Leo. I think compare, like you compare both careers. I think Leo has done. They're both amazing for sure. But Leo is like he's becoming the new Jack Nicholson. Brad's becoming the new Robert Redford. Yeah. And uh, who would you rather Robert hang Redford with though? Too. Leo. I mean, uh, Leo throws the Leo craziest would be, parties in the world. Yeah, he's yeah, always but, on a boat. He's mm-hmm. always on a yacht or his hot tub party. I don't know if you've been listening to these pods lately, but I love boats, and I've had a couple so of uh, boat steam guy. whistles. Leo. <laughs> No, well, here's, well, here's, uh, sorry, did you finish your thought, Unzi? I'm saying Leo. I, I don't know what they're asking. If they're asking about body of work and films, meaning if I'm going to a desert island and I want to either take uh, Leo's whole catalog or Brad's whole catalog, well, shit, I take Leo's whole fucking catalog, obviously. He's Name done the big movies that you love. Shutter of Island. Leo? Yeah. Leo's done far more uh, better movies. That's why I'm than just asking Brad. you to name them. Yes. So, Aviator, Titanic, Romeo and Juliet, Gilbert Grape. Gilbert Grape. Catch me if you can. Thank you. Inception, uh, Shutter Island, which I fucking love. I love that movie. Thank you. <laughs> One of the four you've watched, along with Thelma and Louise. Yep. Uh, I think that Brad's Gangs of New York. I think uh, not Brad. Sorry. I think Leo's done a better body of work. I think his movies are potted. De- Departed. Departed is amazing. The Revenant. Thank you. Eh, it's a little long. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yes, like <laughs> what I'm saying is like Leo's body of work, if not his body, uh, is much better than Brad Pitt's. Uh, Brad Pitt's body work is good. I What's like Brad Pitt's best movie? 
it's great question. So let's go through some of the. So we got we got uh, Fight Club. Fight Club, Fight that's Club. one of the best. best movie, we right? got we got shit like Interview with the Vampire. We got a River Runs Through It. We got Legends of the Fall, which I actually. But I feel mind. like Fight Club is so uh, divisive. It is, mm-hmm. but it's probably one of his best. Uh, Snatch, he's amazing Snatch. in Snatch. Yeah, but, but what's like what, what's his movie that everyone could agree on that they love? That he stars in. Yeah, like that's like that's a Brad movie. That's like his Forrest Gump. Moneyball. Like, Mr. Money. and Mrs. Smith. <laughs> mm. Mr. Ms. Smith was con- yeah that's because Titanic that's the- is Leo's right yes yeah. I think Moneyball is Brad like sort of in like a, like an Oscar sort of like worthy prestige right. film well in that case Leo Leo wins handedly totally but I don't I don't know if the question was like who- we're missing one for sure there's got to be a bigger a Brad, Brad movie a bigger Brad movie he was than that. in um um in Glorious Bastards. World yeah. War Z. He was in it. That's the way to describe it, though. But he right. wasn't the star. The Ocean's Eleven's <laughs> movies. You've World never War seen Z. Inglourious Bastards? Oh my God! You have to see Inglourious Bastards. Okay, did you guys like um, Once Upon a Time in Hollywood? It doesn't or matter. No? That twelve no, I'm monkeys. curious. I'm just curious. Yes or no? You know what? No, I did, and I think that refreshed that made it even harder because like I thought he was amazing in that. Movie. Yeah, I loved Once Upon a Time in Mexico. But I feel like if Leo was. <laughs> Sorry, I've had a lot. I, of I do the same, I do the same mistake with fifty percent of the time. Brad Pitt was in a movie. Called The Mexican with Julia Roberts. Hell yeah. And uh, Sopranos. James Gandolfini. That's exactly. right. But I feel like if, if Brad and Leo were in this room right now, Leo would not make you feel as equal as Brad would. Okay, Shane. We're in the room together with him. With, her, with Brad and Leo. Okay. They're walking out. They go, yo, Shane, we're, we're both going out separately. Who do you want to come with? Well, Leo, I would be like, what's going on here? Brad, I feel like, would be like, you know what? I'm gonna like he's a Brad has guy, a little though, bit yeah. of like Max Kerman in him, where he's like, you know what? I'm gonna be a nice guy right now, and I actually want to be a nice guy. Whereas Leo would be like, I just want to like bang some model. Mike on Much can be found on Twitter and Instagram at Mike on Much. You can subscribe to the show on any platform that has podcasts, uh, Spotify. Do it.